Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I said it right this time. As many of you know, I tend to say the wrong thing. All right. Well, I am so excited to share with you guys tonight about how to love Muslim people around us in our community. We're going to be in Luke 10, 25 through 37 today. So if you want to get your Bibles and turn there, um, pull it up on your phone, whatever it is you like to do. <laughs> Um, so as, as we've mentioned in previous sermons, um, in Gresham, we live in a very diverse community. Uh, we've got cultures, um, all around us that, um, are from all around the world, and we're privileged to be, be able to be in such a diverse area. One of those populations we come in contact with are people of Middle Eastern, African, Asian, Indian, or European descent who practice the religion of Islam. I'm sure many of you know a few things about Islam and what Muslims believe, um, but I wanted to just give you guys a quick overview um, of the religion and what they believe in practice because I think that's important as we um, move forward. It's important for us to know what they believe if we're going to interact with them. So, Muslims have many similar beliefs as Jews and Christians, but they have fundamental differences as well. Muslims have what they call the five pillars of faith. They are shada, or confession of faith, salat, or prayer. Muslims pray five times a day facing Mecca. Swam Ramadan, or a month of fasting, zakat, or giving to the poor. And lastly, hajj, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca every Muslim must make if they're able to. Islam also has six articles of faith, belief in one God, belief in angels, in prophets and messengers, in the holy books, day of judgment, and in predestination, which is that Allah knows everything that will happen. Muslims believe that Muhammad received um, revelation through the angel Gabriel, which he recorded in the Quran. They believe that Jesus is just a man, that he was a messenger of revelation like Moses was, but that he wasn't God and that he didn't even claim to be God. Muslims believe that God will judge every single action they have made on the day of judgment. They believe that if they do more good than bad, they will enter paradise. But if they do more evil than good, they will be sent to hell. Because of this, Muslims try to make sure that their good actions outweigh their bad ones, and they emphasize steering clear of very bad actions like stealing, murder, adultery, lying, stuff like that. They believe that they can repent and be forgiven, but that there are sins that Allah will not forgive. As you can see, although there are similarities between Islam and Christianity, we have fundamental differences. And the main one is that um, Jesus isn't just a prophet, but he is God and man. And he was sent to save the people of the world from their sin and bring us into a restored relationship with God. That we don't need to fear the day of judgment. It's something that we can celebrate because Jesus has wiped the slate clean for us. And he has set us free from the bondage of sin, and it's no longer dependent on what we do because we've all been condemned. We all don't, don't deserve to be in relationship with God because of his mercy he has made a way for us. So, just like we have fundamental differences with Muslims, the Jews had fundamental differences with Samaritans. And Jesus turned the tables when he told a story about a good Samaritan. Let's read Luke 10, 25 through 37 together. And behold, a lawyer, which would be someone who studies the law, stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. 
But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he sent to, set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. It's interesting that in this passage, the Lord asks the provocative question of Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Many times, we want to qualify who our neighbor is. We want that person to be someone who's like us. Perhaps we see someone who's in an important role, like a priest or a Levite, to be a great example of serving others. But Jesus flips the script by using someone unexpected as an example of a good neighbor. We want to qualify who our neighbor is. We want to pick and choose. But Jesus defines our neighbor to even be people who Id whose ideologies we reject. And those people may be the ones to offer us help when those like us don't. For Samaritan to help a Jew was a big deal. Samaritan, Samaritans and Jews did not agree on very much. They differed on where to worship, how to worship, things like that. Even a person we fundamentally disagree with can show love and care. Sometimes love and compassion that our own people don't show. I had the opportunity my junior year of college to go to Egypt. And the group I was with invited a Muslim woman to come and educate us about how she prayed and her worldview. There came a time when she um, wanted to ask us some questions, and she asked us something along the lines of, what do you want to be known for in your life? What do you want your legacy to be? One of, I, one, of, <laughs> one of my friends answered by saying something like, I want to be known for being a good person, doing the right thing, and I want to go to heaven. The Muslim woman looked at my friend and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? You believe in Jesus, that he is gracious, that he will forgive all of your sins. You don't have to fear. She said, I'm a Muslim. I have fear. You don't remember that. I was shocked when I heard this lady encouraging and ministering to my friend in her faith because as far as I knew and experienced with her, she was very devout in practicing Islam. But she took time to be a good neighbor to my friend. What if the story of the Good Samaritan was about a Muslim helping a Christian? What feelings would you feel? You may feel a similar feeling that the Jews hearing the story felt. Close your eyes and imagine with me as I retell this parable as the Good Muslim. A man who studied in Bible college and was a deacon at his local church stood up to test Jesus, saying, What shall I do to inher inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, 
desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was walking downtown Gresham when he encountered robbers who beat him until he was half dead. Now by chance, a big name theologian was driving down that road. And when he saw him, he looked away and continued on. Then a local pastor, when she saw him from a ways off as she was walking, passed by on the other side. But a Muslim man, when he was driving by where he was and saw him, he had compassion. He pulled his car over, went to him, and bound up his wounds the best he could. Then the Muslim man drove him to the hospital and did not leave his side that night while he was treated. And the next day at the front desk of the hospital, he said, how much is the bill going to be for his treatment? I will pay the debt for him. And when I come back to check on him tomorrow, and so on, I will pay whatever it costs to take care of him. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who was robbed? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. How does hearing this story in a modern light make you feel? Do you think now you could relate to the lawyer questioning Jesus? Perhaps maybe even the theologian or the pastor in my story. As I was writing this story in a modern context, it became so much more real to me. I knew that Samaritans and Jews didn't like each other and didn't get along, but it wasn't in my culture. It wasn't something I could really understand. But in the light of Christians and Muslims, I see now how Jesus was really flipping the script on the Jews by using, using someone they disagreed with fundamentally as an example of how to go the extra mile in love. The lawyer, or Christian man in my story, wanted to justify himself. He didn't want to recognize that everybody was his neighbor, and he was hoping that Jesus agreed with him. When Jesus turned the table on him and showed him someone he disagreed with to be the example of loving one's neighbor, he shattered the lawyer's ability to make excuses for himself. Not only should the lawyer love his neighbor, but he should go the extra mile like the Samaritan did in the story because the Samaritan had more compassion than the other people in his own group, the people that should have not looked twice when it came to help, helping someone in need. It's assumed that the man who was beaten in the story was also Jewish since he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. How much humility do you think it took the Samaritan to help someone who his people, groups, people group was at odds with? How much humility do you think it took the Samaritan? Oh, sorry. And likewise, how much compassion and humility should we carry when we love on those who we disagree with, like Muslim people? Like the Samaritan in the parable, we should always seek to humbly serve, love, and have compassion on those around us even those that are very different from us. How can we look at this story and think, how can I go the extra mile in loving my neighbor? Or, with the theme of today, how can I go the extra mile in loving my Muslim neighbor? So, why exactly should we love Muslims? Number one is, they are our neighbor. Another answer to the lawyer's question in verse 29 and who is my neighbor would be anyone around you. They are people who worship Jesus and people who don't. We don't get to choose who our neighbors are. They're those in our community who we would agree with and those we wouldn't agree with. I'm sure you've all seen that there are Muslim people all around us in our community. The odds of you running into a Muslim person on any given day is pretty high especially since now in the next few weeks we're going to start seeing refugees coming in from Afghanistan. Like the Samaritan, we should have compassion for those we encounter 
all around us. If they are in a tough situation or not, we should seek to exemplify Christ's love to them. So we should love Muslim people because they're our neighbors, and we should love them because God loves them, and they are made in his image. Our neighbors are also people who are made in the image of God. In John 3.16 we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves the world. He created our Muslim brothers and sisters in his image, and he desires that they would come to know freedom in Christ Jesus. So like God loves Muslim people, we should love them. Another reason that we should seek to love Muslim people is because they are really close to knowing uh, the freedom in Christ, and we can share that good news with them. How beautiful would it be to share the gospel with a Muslim person? Like the Samaritan who paid the debt for the man who was beaten, Jesus has paid their debt. They no longer have to worry about weighing their good and bad works. Our hearts should burn with compassion and love for Muslim people, that they would be set free and know the truth of who Jesus really is. So how can we love Muslim people? It's a different religion than ours, and it can feel daunting to approach someone who views the world in such a different way than us. First of all, I believe it's really important that we learn about their culture and their religion. Like I shared some information about Islam in the beginning of my sermon, it's important for us to have a basic understanding of what Islam is and a Muslim person's worldview. This helps us to be culturally sensitive and to show care for them because we've taken time to learn about what they believe. I think it also makes great stepping stones to talking about the gospel with a Muslim who we befriend because we understand how they view their faith, how they view their works and their actions. You can easily learn about Islam through a Google search or um, on YouTube, there's a lot of content creators who are Muslims who seek to educate about their culture and current events that they're going through. Another great way to learn about Muslim people is to ask them good and respectful questions once you've developed a relationship with them. With that, it's also important to carefully consider stereotypes that you may have or that our society has when interacting with a Muslim. Be aware of how you speak to a Muslim person. Don't, as don't assume things about their culture, like perhaps that a woman wearing hijab is oppressed. And don't ask certain questions unless you've taken time to deepen your understanding and deepen your relationship with them. Being culturally sensitive and wanting to genuinely learn when interacting with Muslim people can show them care and love. Muslim people in America tend to feel unwelcome by Americans from other religions or cultures because of comments on their dress, being called terrorists, or being targets of harassment. We have the opportunity to make them feel welcome and make them feel loved in our interactions with them. The second thing we can do to show Muslims love is to befriend them. Like I said before, I don't think you can go to a grocery store, restaurant, without running into at least one Muslim person in our community. There's about 2,000 Muslim people in Multnomah County. But it can be hard to approach a stranger and start a conversation past hello. So a friendly smile can go a long way in just making a Muslim person feel welcome. But right now, we have masks, <laughs> so no one can see our faces. Um, and when I was reading, Multnomah, has, um, Multnomah County has a web page about um, how to be a good ally to Muslim people. And one thing um, the people on that web page said to do um, 
instead of just smiling, would be to say, uh, hello, salam, or salam alaikum, which is an Arabic greeting that means peace be with you. Just a small thing like that can go a long way in making a Muslim person feel welcome and feel loved. And if you work with anyone who is Muslim, take some time to really get to know them and form a relationship with them. Or if you see a regular customer coming in at your place of work, that's another great way to connect, make a connection. And there are some local organizations um, that can connect you and um, just help you support Muslim people as well. The first one is the Muslim Educational Trust, which is based in Portland. And it's an organization that holds events to encourage um, conversations with other faiths so that they can learn how to um, just understand and um, build bridges. Um, and then they also support Muslim students and help Muslim immigrants. And then the next one is a faith-based Portland uh, organization, and it's called Refugee Care Collective. And currently, they're raising funds to welcome in Afghani refugees by providing them temporary housing, food, winter coats, and a family or youth mentor who can help them in the transition of coming from a completely other country, not, um, you know, maybe not speaking English, um, and just help, help with that transition, help them know they have a friendly face. So when we make effort to form friendship with a Muslim person, it's a great way that we can show them the love of Christ. And lastly, I think one of the most important things we can do is pray for Muslim people. We want to see Muslim people around us come to know the freedom that's in Jesus. And one of the greatest things we can do, like I said, is pray. We want to have compassion like the Good Samaritan and pray for issues that Muslim people face. Like, like I said, like those in Afghanistan right now who are stuck under extremist rule or it's very dangerous for families. Or those who are targets for harassment like the women in France who are being forced to remove their hijabs. When you see a Muslim person in passing, pray. Pray that the Holy Spirit would open their hearts to the truth about Jesus. So we want to have the love that God has for the, the Muslims in the world that we read about in John 3.16, sending his only son so that everybody would come to know him. And that involves praying Muslim people would come to know the truth. It also includes actively witnessing to Muslim people and befriending them. Muslim people come from all types of nations around the world, and many of them have chosen to settle here in Multnomah County. We have a great opportunity to love them by telling them the good news. This news can bring freedom to a Muslim person who's deeply concerned about their works. Today, ask yourself, what are some ways I can take this life-changing news and bring hope and freedom to a Muslim person? Let's pray.